Hi, everybody. I think it's going live. Yep, there we go. Hi. It's Happy Hour History with the Rye Historical Society, and it is December 13th, already dark. And in, you can see I'm getting ready for the Christmas holidays. We've got a little holly showing there. And we are continuing our reading of Just Rye Harbor by Thomas and Rosemary Clary. And we are on chapter eight tonight. <clears throat> and this book was, uh, just to remind you, it was published in 2005. I'm Debbie Tuohy. I'm a board member of the Rye Historical Society. And um, here we are continuing our reading during the COVID time. And as numbers climb here in New Hampshire and actually all over the country, just hope that you're all healthy and well. And thanks for tuning in tonight. So we shall start now. Chapter eight is planning for a boating and recreation center. As reported in the Portsmouth Herald of March 22nd, 1934, the Rye Harbor Improvement Association was formed as the culmination of plans for the enlargement and improvement of Rye Harbor that had been brewing for years. At a town meeting on March 13, 1934, it was voted to appropriate $10,000 as the town's share of Rye Harbor improvements, provided that aid for the project could be secured from the state and federal governments. Town officials noted that the surrender of taxable property values on the project would cost another $13,000. The $23,000 total was considered a fair contribution on the part of the town. Acting Chairman <clears throat> Shirley S. Philbrook conducted the meeting with William R. Philbrook as secretary. The development plans for the harbor, as she outlined them, called for the construction of two breakwaters to protect the shoreline from erosion by the sea and the dredging of the channel to enable small crafts to enter the harbor. The estimated cost was from 60,000 to 200,000, depending on the amount and type of construction done. I'm gonna have a sip of my tea and you should have a sip of your drink. Oh, and as a matter of fact, look at that, Rye, New Hampshire, 1623. We have our 400 year anniversary coming up in a few years. All the work would be on state-owned land. <clears throat> it is intended that the material taken from the harbor and the dredging operation be used in filling in nearby marshland and thus providing a big parking space for automobiles and an opportunity to erect bathhouses, etc., and provide an opportunity for people from all parts of the state to visit this beautiful spot of the New Hampshire coast. Philbrick stated that it would be of great benefit to summer residents who are interested in yachting as it will enable them to keep their boats near their summer residence, which has been impossible in the past and would attract many more people to this section. The March 22nd Herald article details who spoke on this important meeting. State engineer William A. Grover reflected on how the highway would be affected by the project. Judge Thomas H. Sims gave a, pre a presentation concerning the history of Rye Harbor, which proved instructive and entertaining. Dr. Samuel T. Ladd, collector of the Port of Boston, gave an interesting talk that stressed the advantages that would come from the project. He expressed his belief that Portsmouth and the entire section were on the way to expansion and real progress. Councillor Jane Charles H. Brackett spoke of the interest Governor Winnett and members of his council showed for the plans, adding that nearly every member of the council was in favor of the project. The final speaker of the evening was former Mayor F. W. Hartford of Portsmouth, summer resident at Wall Sands. Shirley Philbrick's introduction of Hartford recalled his outstanding work on behalf of the New Hampshire seacoast Portsmouth and its Navy Yard 
and the entire area. Hartford said, I wish to offer my aid in backing this plan for the enlargement and improvement of Rye Harbor. No one appreciates more than I do the wonderful possibilities that are right here at our door. Having spent a, from six to seven months each year for the past 32 years in Rye, I must be classed as a citizen. At a council meeting on May 29th, 1934, Governor John G. Winnett and the Executive Council directed State Highway Commissioner Frederick E. Everett to do an engineering survey of Rye Harbor. In the autumn of 1934, State Highway Department Chief Engineer Daniel H. Dickinson completed the survey including test borings, soundings, and aerial viewings. His report was submitted on December 27, 1934 to the government and the council. It was voted that the matter be referred for study to the state planning board and to the incoming administration. His study included a report by the advisory committee on the Raleigh Harbor project described the harbor as rectangular in shape and measured approximately 12,000, excuse me, 1,200 feet in width by 2,500 feet in length, with its narrow dimensions opening directly upon the ocean. I'll show you the map that um, it's Routes 1A and Route 1 in 1935. New Hampshire SL. So, three tidal creeks enter the harbor at the westerly end, and considerable erosion was caused by the ebb and flow of the tides through these channels which apparently account in part for the shoal conditions at this end of the harbor. Indications are that the harbor was formerly sheltered by spits made out from the shore at its entrance. This protection no longer exists as the spits have been worn away by tidal action. And I'm chilly in here, so I'm gonna have another sip of my tea. The forward to the same report states that H. Stiles Bridges, the new governor, continued the harbor improvement planning process. The State Planning Board, soon to become the State Planning and Development Commission, appointed an advisory group on February 14, 1935, to make a comprehensive study of the projected improvements. <clears throat> In making decisions, that group relied heavily on Chief Engineer Dickinson's recommendations, which consisted of construction of a stone jetty on each side of the harbor entrance with a channel 400 feet wide between the jetties, dredging the channel and basin to a depth of six feet at mean low water, construction of shore project projection works consisting of hydraulic fill and revetment at the westerly end of the harbor adjacent to the highway, reclamation of marsh, marsh areas surrounding the western end of the harbor by using dredged material, construction of parking areas and public wharf, relocation of a section of state highway, and building a new bridge over a tidal creek, changing course of another tidal creek to eliminate a highway bridge and further prevent and prevent further destruction. Chief Engineer Dickinson estimated the cost of the improvements at $270,160, broken down as follows, $126,900 for the jetties, $79,800 for the channel and basin, $25,900 for the revetment, $6,000 for the wharf, $3,600 for the bridge, 3,400 for road work, and 10% extra factored in for engineering and contingency needs. 
In addition to the above figures, there will be an item of property damage resulting from the acquisition of marshland for the disposal of dredged material and land for highway right-of-way and the remnant between that portion of highway to be abandoned and the low water line of Rari Harbor. This expense, it seems, might properly be considered as charge against the town of Rye. The engineer added, in case the cost of the entire project as outlined requires a greater expenditure than appears warranted at this time, consideration may be given if desired to a program of state construction starting first with the jetties and completing the remainder of the work later as funds become available. The Advisory Committee on the Rye Harbor Project issued its unanimous report, prepared by Shirley Philbrick, to the State Planning and Development Commission on March 26, 1935. Its opening words indicate a breathtaking vision. The primary concept underlying the proposed improvement of Rye Harbor is the creation on the seacoast of New Hampshire of an entirely new recreation center to be owned, operated, and maintained by the state. The project contemplates the improvements of a harbor in order to provide a safe haven for boats, launches, and small crafts, called elsewhere in the report a 30-acre haven for small craft, provision for a protected swimming pool and bathing beach, the creation of areas for out-of-door sports such as Quiotes, a game in which a ring of iron or rope is thrown at an upright pin, tennis, archery, baseball, basketball, parking areas for automobiles, oceanfront picnic grounds. The group adds a second purpose of the project, <clears throat> the protection of a section of the state highway from damage by storms and tidal erosion. The project is not local, but has both state and regional significance. The report made clear that Route 1A, Ocean Boulevard, was of importance to the United States government as a direct connection for three Coast Guard stations located at Wallace Sands, Rye Beach, and Hampton, respectively, and also for military purposes in case of war. The plan called for a depth of 20 feet of water at the harbor entrance at low mean water, where the harbor channel and main basin could be dredged to 15 or more feet at some time in the future. A total of 37 acres were to be reclaimed and improved. A 12 acre strip of marshland at the westerly end of the harbor, 1300 feet long by over 400 feet wide, was owned by the state. At the north end of the harbor, between the water and the relocated highway were 13 privately owned acres the plan would have the state acquire. On the west and north sides of the relocated highway were 12 acres of privately owned land to be acquired by the state. It was estimated that 25 total acres of private land would cost $25,000 to acquire, bringing the total project cost to about $300,000. The report discussed park possibilities at Ragged Neck, where there were seven acres of high ground and six acres of marshland. Over the years, it had developed a reputation for being one of the coolest points of land north of Boston on hot summer days. It would make a unique park with ample space on which several thousand people might congregate with the ocean on three sides. The report went on. Certain supplementary undertakings have suggested by various interested agencies and noted that the cost for added facilities would be much less if done at the same time as the harbor proposal. One of the suggestions was the creation of a military drill field and airport. The, dr the drill field would be used by the National Guard in the summer months and would be available year round for service as an emergency airport. At the time of the early 1930s, the National Guard encampment and drill ground were nearly a mile inland and practice for coastal defense was hampered. Dredging from the harbor would provide fill that could construct an 
an area of 30 acres to the north of the state highway. The estimate for this was $125,000. It was hoped that an additional $120,000 in federal funding would be available for the construction of buildings to be used by the National Guard. The notion of an emergency airfield north of the harbor came from an official in the aeronautics branch of the Department of Commerce. This location is directly on the course taken by the airlines flying daily between Boston and State of Maine points on an approved air mail route. He also noted the proximity of the harbor to this emergency field and the possibility of the use of the harbor surface for the landing of amphibian planes. Provisions for a Coast Guard base were also discussed quoting S.R. Sands, commander of the 1st Coast Guard District, who had written the following on August 11, 1930 to Colonel S.A. Cheney of the U.S. Army's Custom House in Boston. I desire to go on record as being in favor of the dredging of Rye, New Hampshire, harbor to the depth of approximately 10 feet and the construction of a breakwater at such point for points as may be considered feasible by your department for the protection of all fishing, pleasure, and government craft that may have occasion to use the same. I'm going to have a sip right now. This is a um, spicy tiger is the name of this tea. It's very cinnamony. I like it very much. <clears throat> he emphasized, our life-saving and assistance efforts have been hampered on many occasions when vessels were in distress in waters adjacent to Rye Harbor, owing to the fact that we were unable to assign and maintain life-saving motorboats at that point. The United States Coast Guard Service has stations at Wallace Sands and at Straws Point, which is also Locks Neck which might be combined with the advantage to the service in a single station located on the shore of the improved Rye Harbor. It was also proposed that an open air swimming pool be developed. There is an enlargement of a tidal creek just north of the state highway, which has for years been a favorite swimming place. I have even swum in there myself. Even though the swimming area was just a short distance from the ocean, water temperatures there were regularly at least 10 degrees warmer. According to the report, it was hoped that, at small expense, this location could be converted into an ideal open-air swimming pool contiguous to the bathing, be bathing beach that will be naturally developed on the shores of the harbor. Another suggestion was the construction of state bathhouses at a cost of $20,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was hoped that reasonable charges to the public for their use would make this expense self liquidating. The bathhouses would provide room, suit, and towel. The bathhouses and automobile parking areas were not a whimsical proposal. It was noted in the report that on weekends and holidays during the summer, anyone driving on Route 1A would sometimes find the view of the ocean almost entirely obstructed or cut off by a solid row of motor cars parked on the ocean side of the highway. In addition to being undesirable from an aesthetic standpoint, the growing practice of utilizing automobiles as dressing rooms for transient bathers creates a nuisance problem having certain moral aspects. The report called these people automobile bathers and described these parked cars as having all their windows covered with newspaper, robes, blankets, or articles of clothing of all colors and varieties to provide private dressing rooms for bathing, which even further obstructs the water view of the traveler who is using the highway for its proper purpose. Adding in costs of the military field, military buildings, bathhouses, water supply, and sewerage equipment would have brought the grand total for all projects to $585,000. The state's advisory committee on air transportation had been charged 
was studying the lack of adequate commercial and private aviation facilities in the vicinity of New Hampshire beaches since the dangerous practice of landing on the beaches has been prohibited by federal and state regulations. That would be quite a sight. After the issuance of a preliminary report on airport development dated December 2nd, 1936, the committee had been alerted to the possible relevance of proposed dry harbor improvements and a proposed inland waterway from Newburyport Harbor to Hampton Harbor. In the dredging operations of these proposed improvements, a tremendous amount of material could be secured at a minimum cost fulfilled in the construction of an airport. The committee was seeking to find a suitable aviation facility that could be developed for both land and seaplanes in one place. The Advisory Committee on Air Transportation issued its final report on May 18, 1937. Although the study's cover and first page indicate that the committee was recommending the conservation of Seabrook marshes for future development of an airport and the development of land and seaplane facilities at Rye Harbor, that is not what the contents reveal. The committee thought a field constructed at Rye Harbor would have military importance in connection with the National Guard camp. However, it would be inadequate for a seaplane landing area due to its limited size, though it could be used for the mooring of seaplanes if dredged and protected by breakwaters or jetties as is proposed. The committee was impressed but most by the site on the Seabrook marshes, even as it, as it was adjacent to the proposed inland waterway and thus would eventually have fill available. Also viewed favorably was that Hampton Harbor was immediately adjacent to the Seabrook site and would be adequate for the use of seaplanes if some dredging were done. The Seabrook site could serve as a commercial airport both for the New Hampshire Seacoast region and for Salisbury Beach in Massachusetts. It was also felt that the location of the proposed Seabrook field directly on the airline route from Boston to Bangor would meet any need arising for airmail and passenger service to the Seacoast region and would provide an emergency landing field for already existing airline service. The committee did suggest that an adequate landing field should be developed on the marshes of Rye Harbor primarily for military purposes. A map of the airport at Rye Harbor shows the proposed location directly across from the harbor on the west side of Route 1A. And okay. I think we have time to, chapter nine is not very long, so I think we have time to read a little bit further if you would like. So I'll give it a shot. Chapter nine, rebuilding of Rye Harbor, 1938-1939. The Portsmouth Herald headline of March 13, 1938 told it all. Committee recommends $330,000 for improvements at Rye Harbor. The day before, the National Resources Committee recommended to the Congress that $12,708,000 be spent for New England Harbor and River projects as part of a six-year nation nationwide plan. In the New Hampshire section of the plan, $330,000 was proposed to dredge Rye Harbor and build jetties. In the July 1 edition of the Herald, the headline read, State Seek Funds for Rye Harbor Project. At a meeting between Governor Francis P. Murphy and the Executive Council June 30 at Concord, State Controller Colonel Charles T. Patton was authorized to file with the Federal Aviation of Public Works grant proposal to help carry out seven major construction projects at Rye and Hampton Beaches, including in these applications for federal funds or requests to help pay for the dredging of Rye Harbor, the construction of two jetties at the harbor, 
and the development of a Rye Harbor Airport and seaplane base. And I'll show you the picture of the harbor and its shores were mostly undeveloped with only a few houses before 1939. So you'll see the harbor and on the right hand side you'll see the road that goes out to the end of Harbor Road today. And on the left hand side would be uh, Ragged Neck Park. So that's right. That's Ragged Neck there. And oh, I'm not very good at this. This is where the, eh, the jetties were built here and over there. Ah, terrible at this. And this picture I'll read to you since I've got it right there too. Rye Harbor photographed October 30, 1934 by Fairchild aerial surveys. Because the shallow harbor offered limited area available for moorings, the harbor was dredged in 1941. And boy, actually I'll show this to you again. You really can see how shallow that area is. Okay. Portsmouth Herald of August 5, 1938 announced Rye Harbor Jetty Work approved by President. Expected that actual work on project will get underway within a month. President Roosevelt had given his support for Federal Public Works Administration grant of $126,000 to construct jetties at Rye Harbor. This was in addition to 154,000 appropriated by the New Hampshire State Legislature in 1937. The jetty was to be built by the state of New Hampshire with the aid of a grant by the Public Works Administration. Of the estimated $280,000 cost, there was a federal provision that 55% of the total had to come from the state. <clears throat> this state money was the culmination of work by special, special legislative commission created to advise the governor and council on public works projects under the state's million dollar construction program approved by the 1935 legislature. The project involved the construction of two stone jetties, one running northerly and the other southerly. The jetties were to have a core of chip stones and be capped with 12 to 16 ton stones. The purpose of the project was to provide adequate protection of small boats and as a coastline protection. It was expected to take a month to do the preliminary work of drawing up plans and specifications and then gain approval from the New York Office of the Public Works Administration. The contract for the construct, actual construction of the jetties had to go out to bid. Five proposals came in ranging from $174,582 to $252,569.80. Winning the contract was low bidder Wyman Simpson Construction Company of Waterville, Maine. Approval again had to be obtained from the Public Works Administration's New York office before the actual work began. And here's a picture of the jetties under construction and some of the stonework right there in 1939. Pretty much what it appears today, but here you have what some of those rocks look like before they get out there. Not rocks, the massive boulders. <clears throat> Federal projections estimated that the jetty project would provide 280,000 man hours of employment a third of these hours were employment at the actual construction site, giving jobs to local craftsmen hired by private contractors at prevailing rates of pay. The other two thirds would be for the state and national manufacturers who created offsite the materials for the project. Plans moved along steadily. The Portsmouth Herald reported work on Rye Harbor development gets underway. Governor Francis P. Murphy releases lever to send first boulder of formation of jetties into waters of harbor. On October 14, 1938, at 1230 in the afternoon, New Hampshire's Governor Murphy pulled the lever of a motor truck 
which then dumped a large boulder into the harbor to start the project. Following the ceremonies for the launch of the jetty work, the group of dignitaries and invited guests went to Saunders for, <laughs> for a lobster dinner. Shirley Philbrick of Rye Beach, an important catalyst who worked for years encouraging the improvement of Rye Harbor, was in Idaho at the time and could not be present. The late Fernando W. Hartford was also a prime mover in securing the Harbor Development Project and had been chairman of the advisory committee on the Rye Harbor Project. On October 28, contractors Wyman and Simpson started dumping stone in the North Jetty. In November, the Portsmouth Herald featured the story, Work Progressing Well on Rye Harbor Jetties. Favorable, favorable weather has aided in speeding, speeding up construction scheduled to be completed on or before August 2nd. On the morning of November 10, officials measured the core of the North Jetty at 270 feet, half the distance of the completed jetty. The core was being chinked with small stones so that trucks could back onto the jetty and unload granite blocks. Wow, what a sight that would be. Most of the stone used in the core was Class B stone, which specifications stated should weigh at least four to six tons. In fact, they weighed 10 to 12 tons, according to Public Works Administration officials. Stone blocks were carried by truck from the railroad yard at Hampton to Ragged Neck. The stones were quarried in Chelmsford, Mass., and in Wells, Maine. After workers completed the 540-foot jetty, they were to build a nose at the channel end. After the core for the nose was built, granite blocks would be fitted into the slopes on either side, and Class A granite would be used to complete the jetty's top. In early November, workers were forced to wear oil skins during high tides, which ran between 10 and 11 feet because spray was leaping over the unfinished jetty. By mid-November, it was expected that tides would be back to normal and that construction could continue unimpeded. 16 men were directly employed on the jetty work. A Portsmouth Herald headline on December 12 read, Rye Harbor North Jetty complete, nearly complete half complete, sorry. Amount of core complete today measures 480 feet. Many visit site of project at Ragged Neck. 75 more feet of stone had to be laid to the tip of the core of the jetty nose. The jetty was up to 540 feet in length, measuring from the shore to the center of the nose. Despite bad weather and very high tides, 9,000 tons of stone were placed into the jetty with no stone weighing less than four tons and many of them weighing 12 to 14 tons. <laughs> On weekends, Ragged Neck became a parking lot filled with the cowers of those curious to learn what progress had been made on the jetties. On Sunday in early December, it rained nearly the entire afternoon and the roadway at Ragged Neck was a sea of mud due to the wheels of the trucks heavily loaded with stone. In spite of that, there were 109 visitors. The Public Works Administration official in charge of the site, H. B. Dorr, was always willing to give statistical data and information to visitors, reported the Herald. Okay, I'm gonna have a sip of my tea, and you should have a sip of your cocktail. In December, mountainous waves lashed against the area for two days, taking all of the rock chinking from the jetty roads over which the trucks had to drive to carry the granite onto the jetties. It took three or four days to replace the road chinking, but the project was still ahead of schedule. Also, the scale pan with four tons of rock chinking in it was washed from the South Jetty during the early part of the storm. When the North Jetty Corps was completed, 1,704 tons of capping stone had been placed around the outer edge and a total of 21,384 tons of stone 
had been placed in the jetties. By July 12, 1939, the jetty work was 96% completed. On that date, contractors Wyman and Simpson were 42 days ahead of schedule and due to finish in two weeks. Although the work had been estimated to cost $175,000, there was a savings to the state of about $40,000. The amount of stone needed for the jetties had been much less than first anticipated. The North Jetty was completed April 29, 1939 and contained 19,000 tons of stone. The South Jetty, as of July 12th, contained about 16,000 tons. And here is a picture. I'll read the caption and then show you the picture. Rye men returning from a visit to the site of the Squala sinking with the submarine Sculpin in the background. Left to right in front is Leighton Remick, Clinton Gaskell, and Manning Remick aboard the boat Alert. Men in the rear are unidentified, taken in 1939. So again, they had been visiting the Squala sinking and the Sculpin submarine is what you will see in the back. And the boat that they're on is the Alert. And that completes chapter nine. So that will be where we end up with History Happy Hour today. And thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy this reading. It's pretty interesting. And the fact that we have the harbor being dredged right now, which I didn't get down there to look at today, but will this week and post some more pictures online. I'm behind on that. Um, but you should see that there is an album on our Facebook with, and I will continue to do that, um, pictures from the dredging currently, and the, um, at least the barge that's there is from Rockland, Maine. So again, there are counterparts from probably Massachusetts and Maine, as well as New Hampshire. Thank you for joining us today for Happy Hour History. Um, stay well, stay very safe, think local, Stay local with your family. Love from a distance. Baby do Facebook Live. Baby hug, air hug. But do please be safe. And hallelujah, we have we have vaccinations on the on the way starting this week. So our uh, immediate healthcare workers and first responders. And those that are in assisted facilities and nursing homes, I'm sure they will be getting vaccinated very, very soon. So this is a good start for everybody. Thanks. This is Debbie Tui, board member of the Rye Historical Society, saying good night and reminding you that should you want to do some shopping at the um, Rye Historical Society, we are open by appointment. You can see um, on our website what we have listed for books, cards, um, mugs, hats, caps, and they are for sale. So if you want to uh, pick something up for your stocking stuffers or any other items, please contact us at info. You have the information or you can call us, or you can um, stop by. Thanks so much. Good night. Bye.